Greetings from Dr. Peter McLuhan, your host for another adventure in the life Jesus modeled. Our topic today is casting out demons. For several weeks we have been examining the five mandates Jesus gave to his disciples. According to Matthew, Jesus said, As you go, preach saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Matthew chapter 10, verse 7 and 8. Disciples are not people who know a lot about Jesus and the, and the Bible. Disciples are followers of Jesus who can do what Jesus did. Jesus said that we are to preach the kingdom, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, and cast out demons. Jesus modeled all five of these mandates before he gave them to his disciples as their mission for life. People loved listening to Jesus talk about the kingdom of God. Jesus healed everyone who asked him for healing. Uh, Jesus brought the widow of Nain's son back to life, modeling how to raise the dead. He cleansed lepers who came to them, modeling for us how to heal incurable diseases. He cast out demons, most notably the man from Gadara. He modeled for his disciples how to walk in all of the mandates that he gave to them. Last week, I shared a five-step process to follow when healing the sick. After I began using these steps, the number of people who were healed in our ministry significantly increased. Please review last week's message to strengthen your healing ministry. Today's topic, Cast Out Demons, is so important, we will study it over the next several episodes of The Life Jesus Modeled. As I travel around the world, I have observed that most ministers try to deliver people from spirits by shouting at them to go in Jesus' name. Many try to get demonized persons to say, Jesus is Lord. These are religious practices that have become popular, but not necessarily effective. Demons are not deaf. And demons have no problem saying that Jesus is Lord. There is a better way to cast out evil spirits. Jesus did not model shouting or asking people to say, I am the Messiah, I am the Messiah. <laughs> Note with me, Jesus did not look for demons, but demons looked for Jesus. I don't look for demons, but demons look for me. Spirits are drawn to the power that followers of Jesus carry. In this message, I would like to talk about three ways to move more effectively in the ministry of deliverance. First is to know the difference between power and authority. We move in power when we heal diseases, but we move in authority when we cast out evil spirits. Remember, Jesus called together the 12 disciples and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, Luke chapter 9 and verse 1. Then we read, Behold, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you, Luke chapter 10 and verse 19. The sons of Sceva failed to cast out evil spirits because they were not walking in the authority that Jesus taught Paul to walk in. We read in Acts chapter 19 and verse 15, the evil spirit answered and said to these sons, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? Evil spirits leave when they recognize the authority you have over them. There is no need to shout at demons. They are not deaf. And when you speak to spirits with authority, they must obey you. In dealing with spirits, we pray less and we talk more. 
When we recognize the authority we carry, we command demons to obey our voice. Uh, judges do not shout at persons that they sentence. Judges use their authority to pronounce a sentence. They give an eviction notice to someone who is trespassing. Uh, judges command what is to be done to that person. And in deliverance, it is our job to take authority over spirits and to evict them. The Apostle John said in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. This means we never need to ask God if it is his will to evict spirits from people. Second, it is important to understand God's order of created beings. When we do, then we realize why we have authority over demons and why demons seek to possess humans. This is what we read in Psalm, verse, Psalm 8. What is man that you take thought of him, or the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you have crowned him with glory and majesty, and you have made him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Uh, Psalm 8, verses 4 through 6 in the New American Standard Bible. In many translations, in verse 5, you will find the word angels rather than the word God, as the translation I just read does. And why is this? When the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek by the scholars in the city of Alexandria some 200 years before Christ, the Hebrew word Elohim was translated as angels in this psalm. So this is God's divine order of creation. It's God, man, angels, whether good or bad, and then animals. And spirits occupy humans, uh, try to occupy humans, to manifest the rebellion against God and take over that the power we have been given by God himself. And this brings me to the third aspect of deliverance that I'd like to talk with you uh, about in this message. Can believers have evil spirits? Now, demons love it when people argue if believers can or cannot have a demon. We have authority to command spirits to leave because we were created as higher beings than angels. I invite you to think uh, more deeply with me about the subject or the question or whether or not followers uh, of Jesus can be demonized. While people argue and get angry about it, demons happily continue to manifest their hatred towards God in people. What is worse is that while we argue, we leave the demons in place. The question is not, are they inside or outside? The question is, are they present? Now, one of the reasons believers are confused by the subject has to do with how the Bible was translated from Greek into the common languages and especially into English. In many translations, we find two different words used to describe the activity of demons in people. Six times we read about a person who was possessed by a demon. Uh, for example, when Jesus came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of tombs so fierce that no one could pass by that way. Uh, these uh, persons, according to this text, were possessed this is Matthew chapter 8 and verse 28. But seven times we read about a person who was oppressed by a demon. For example, the Canaanite woman uh, from that region came and was crying out, Have mercy, O Lord, son of David, on my daughter. She is severely oppressed by a demon. Uh, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 22. So here is what we need to know to think more deeply about this. There is only one Greek word for both of these words, uh, possessed or oppressed. It is the word daimonizomai. 
So in the Greek, there's no difference between being oppressed or being possessed. It is the same word, daimonizomai. And believers and non-believers can both be demonized. Uh, listen to what the Apostle Paul said to the believers in the city of Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27. Do not give the devil an opportunity. Isn't that an interesting expression? Now the Greek word for opportunity is the word topos. And it refers to a place or an occasion or a location. It is the Greek word or the Greek root for the English word topographical, as in topographical maps. And what Paul said to the Ephesian believers is, do not give the devil real estate or a place to occupy in your life. Then the writer to the Hebrews gives this warning to the followers of Jesus. He says, take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. What startling words, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. This verse clearly says that believers can have evil in their hearts. I assure you that evil is not from the Spirit of God but it is from another spirit, an evil spirit. One time I counseled with a lady struggling with the spirit of fear. As we talked, she had a powerful encounter with Holy Spirit. After we talked, she sent me the following note. While we were sitting in the cafe, she wrote, uh, talking about healing and demon possession, what appeared to be unexpected you commanded a demon of fear to go. At that moment, what felt like a large metal bolt flew out of the back of my neck. My neck was no longer heavy, straining to keep my head upright. The pain at the base of my neck where that heavy bolt was embedded has not returned. What a powerful story. To anyone listening who is gripped with fear, I break the power of the Spirit over you and command that Spirit to leave you right now in the name of Jesus. If you just felt fear leave you, uh, please write to me and share your story with me. Uh, in the early church, we discover that a pastor by the name of T Timothy uh, struggled with the spirit of fear. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. Paul writes to this pastor and says to him, God did not give us a spirit of fear or timidity, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Now, not all deliverances are as easy as the one that I just described for you. Uh, some spirits are embedded so deeply that we need a battle plan to remove them. And next week, I will share with you part two on this important teaching on deliverance as we continue to study the life Jesus modeled. Let's take a few moments and pray over some of the things that we've just heard. Maybe you really are struggling with the spirit of fear. I break that fear off of your life right now. I say, fear, go in the name of Jesus. Release your grip on this person who is listening to this message at this very moment. Now, there are three spirits that Pastor Pastors run into regularly, and they are the spirit of fear, the spirit of shame, and the spirit of control. These are the three spirits that entered in the Garden of Eden with uh, Adam and Eve, and all through humanity, these spirits in one form or another uh, are tormenting people. They are base points of attack uh, into humans' lives, and we want to come against them. So fear, we break your grip in Jesus' name. Uh, shame for whatever things that you have done gives a spirit of shame an, oppor an opportunity to get a foothold in your life. Things that you are embarrassed about that you would, as it were, hide from one another or hide from God. That's the spirit of shame. And God wants to remove your shame uh, so that he can r bring honor into your life and restore what has been broken you're struggling with the spirit of shame. I break that shame off of you now. Whatever you've done, wherever you've been, wherever you've gone, is not further than God can reach down into your life 
and to give you a new opportunity. Shame, go in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, come and fill this precious one with your spirit that they feel the honor of your presence, feel honorable in your presence because shame is gone. And fear and shame always have as their traveling companion the spirit of control because when we have fear and when we have shame, we begin trolling, controlling events, circumstances, and people so that we look as good as we can possibly look and control grips our lives and we're always worrying what other people think about us. I set you free from that endless treadmill of trying to be win the approval of others and controlling circumstances. Spirit of control, I break your power right now on precious people listening uh, to this message. These are the leading spirits that attempt to keep followers of Jesus in bondage. And so we break their power. And we release healing into your life. Uh, this uh, lady who felt the bolt came out of her neck. It's such an interesting story. I had no idea any of that happened as I said those words very quietly to her in the restaurant where we were. I'm so grateful for her testimony. So not only was she set free, she had physical, um, physical improvement in her body. Uh, the weight that she spoke about in her neck was broken. You're carrying a heavy weight. You don't even know that you're carrying and you won't really know until it's gone. The gentleman was set free from some very long-term habits, and he said to me, I was under such a heavy weight, and that weight has been lifted off of me. I lift the weight of shame. I lift the weight of fear. I lift the weight of control off of you. And whatever else it is that is binding you uh, as you listen to this message, fear go, shame go, control go, we release upon you a wave of the Holy Spirit. You've never received Jesus as your Savior. Would you receive him right now? As these things leave you, the Spirit of God will come into you. Invite Holy Spirit to fill your life where you are right now. Say, come Holy Spirit, fill me. Give me all of the gifts of God you have for me, for your presence. Thank you, Lord. Next week, we'll continue studying the life Jesus modeled. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.